Honourable Senator, Senator McKim has submitted a proposal under Standing Order 75 today. It is shown at item 16 on today's order of business. Is consideration of the proposal supported? I note the requisite number of senators have stood. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. Th thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Will I rise to speak to this very oh, important matter? Senator before... Hanson Young, can I just ask that you uh, move it for me? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy President, I move the motion standing in my name and uh, would like to ensure that as we debate this issue today, people understand the real urgency of this matter. We have environment laws in this country that allow for the environment minister, when giving approval for new projects, whether it's a mine or a new uh, gas well, to not even consider the climate impacts of such projects. We live in an era of climate crisis, of biodiversity crisis. We are edging quickly this year to a summer that is going to be absolutely horrible, hotter, drier and more extreme. And yet we have laws in this country that do not even consider how those climate fires and the climate crisis is being made worse by the expansion of fossil fuels. Every new coal or gas, pro or gas project risks the future of our Murray-Darling Basin, the food bowl of our nation. Every new coal and gas project puts our reef at risk. Every new coal and gas project, Madam Deputy President, risks the future of our children. Every new coal and gas project puts Australia's risk of more frequent and more devastating and more deadful bushfires nearer and nearer in our front, view, in our front mirror. Every new coal and gas project fuels extinction. Australia was the first country to record mammal extinction as a result of climate change, and we can't afford any more. Australia was one of the first countries to really experience the extreme weather events of the bushfires and, of course, of the floods this millennia. And we know that those extreme weather events are made worse and worse by the climate crisis. And every time a new coal mine or a new gas mine is opened up or expanded, it is making our climate crisis worse. This year, the Environment Minister, whose job it is to protect the environment, has given the stamp of approval to not just one, but two, three, four, at least five projects, fossil fuel projects, that are fuelling the climate crisis and will make this summer's bushfires worse. Just this year. And the reason is we have environment laws that ignore the climate damage and climate risk of pollution from coal and gas. We urgently need to fix this. We cannot rely on the goodwill of government to deny approval of these projects. We've seen that. We know that the fossil fuel lobby in this country is too strong, is still calling the shots, is still applying pressure to members of parliament and government. But in 2023, as we face an even worsening climate, it is time to fix these laws and make the minister do her job. Thank you. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And, uh, at the outset, I want to um, recommit the Coalition's view that 
When it comes to environmental laws, we need to have balance. We need to be able to balance economic needs against environmental needs and make sure we have an economy that's functioning while we have an environment that sustains life. And, uh, that is paramount in this debate and sometimes gets lost. Uh, you know, we shouldn't have it too far one way and nor too far way the other way either. This motion doesn't achieve balance. There is inflammatory language and, of course, I think at the end of the day, as evidenced by what we've just heard and indeed some of the remarks earlier in the day, uh, it is leading us to a point which is really just about saying no to these projects. They'll say it's about assessments, but they will say it is all about no at the end of it. We just don't want these projects to happen, which doesn't take account. And Senator, Senator uh, uh, Rice, rather, who of course has been interjecting, and I know you're about to call her up, uh, Acting Deputy President, says, yes, that's right. But that attitude and that argument does not take account of the fact that we as a society require energy to sustain jobs, to live, to run hospitals, to keep the lights on. And that is the terrible approach that is being taken by the Australian Greens, which of course does not achieve balance. And that is why we won't be supporting a political motion of this nature. Now, having said all of that, having said all of that, and despite the fact that uh, such an approach would be bad for Australia in so many ways, right across the country, particularly in the regions, I might add, um, there is a lot more at play here which is a cause for concern, and that is in relation to our environmental laws. Um, and it was quite clear today in uh, listening to an answer that was given to a question asked by Senator Hanson Young about um, reforms and this very issue, as a matter of fact. Uh, and um, it was apparent to me that the government is considering going down this pathway um, or a version of what's being proposed. Of course, the Greens would like to have it happen tomorrow. The government's working through their protracted, delayed, and blown out process. But uh, at the end of the day, it does look very much like another deal has been done between Labor and the Greens. So we'll see the detail of that over time. But I want to talk more broadly about the issue we face with environmental laws in this country. And Senator Hanson Young makes some very valid points around the fact that the laws aren't fit for purpose. They need reform. The Samuel Review said so. The minister said so. And I'll never forget that press club address that uh, Minister Plibersek gave, talking about the urgent need to act on environmental law reform, the need to protect our environment, to stop extinctions, to make sure the laws were fit for purpose, to provide certainty to business, to the community, to the environmental movement, to have streamlined processes. It was all very, very urgent. Now, all of that seems to have just been words, because uh, despite those calls for urgent action and a commitment by the minister that things would get cracking, we don't have a day to waste. Despite the commitment to zero new extinctions, despite the commitment to 30 per cent of land being preserved for conservation purposes by 2030 and all of the other commitments that have been made, we are still nowhere near conclusion on reform of environmental laws. And again, Senator Hanson Young's good work revealed that there's at least a 12-month delay in the government's efforts to reform these laws. So far be it from a, a, a need for urgent action, and the government is firing on all cylinders to reform this area of work. We are now around two years behind schedule on these reforms. They were announced they were going to happen. Uh, we'd be fixing everything. We'd be stopping extinctions. We'd have a clearer pathway for businesses to seek approvals to do anything. But now that's another two years off. And so that's why I look at this motion, which is kind of odd given there's a position in this chamber to not deal with the nature of repair market legislation before we see the full suite of environmental law reforms in this country. And that's a wise course of action, because we have a very much scrambled egg when it comes to the EPBC Act, which we are seeking to reform, yet the government is trying to stack up schemes and programs that will no doubt be out of date by the time these laws are passed, because the basic laws that we need to reform in this place will change. And the motion here today, the legislation that I understand has just been introduced, is another version of that too. We're tinkering around the edges rather than the government getting on and do, doing what they promised they would do as a matter of urgency and reforming national environmental laws. The changes need to happen at the base level. We need to get the basics right. The environmental laws need to happen. I've not heard from the government about what they intend to do. Others have. Some in the community have. 
but the opposition Thank hasn't. Thank you, Senator Dunham. Your time has expired. Senator White. Acting Deputy President, contrary to the assertions made by the Greens Party in the Chamber today, the Federal Labor Government is committed to bringing down emissions and protecting our natural environment. The evidence of this commitment exists in statute books, pieces of legislation made law, often with the support of the Greens, who have brought this motion to the Senate today. It's true that we've worked with the Greens to implement a climate target, to legislate a net zero commitment and to legislate a climate safe uh, safeguard mechanism. But, is, but as is usual, when it comes to motions moved by the Greens, that bigger picture of what the government has achieved and the evidence of the government's commitment to climate reform and environmental protection has been ignored. For example, it's still true that any dis decision taken by the Climate and Energy Minister when considering coal and gas projects must comply with emissions targets and our net zero commitment. Our climate safeguard laws were introduced to ensure that any new projects emitting over 100,000 tonnes of emissions must cut those emissions by up to 4.9 per cent per year or offset those emissions. This also applies to the 215 uh, largest polluting sites in Australia and acts as a five-year rolling cap. The government's whole environmental and energy transition framework is concentrated on locating an appropriate balance which requires the climate minister to assess when new, whether new fossil fuel developments are consistent with the goal of bringing down industrial emissions. That was the point of the safeguard mechanism that we developed with the Greens and the independents. And in that vein, it is clear to everyone that our transition to net zero emissions and renewable energy is a massive job. Transitioning smoothly towards meeting our targets is an economic challenge as well as an environmental one. Getting 82 per cent renewable energy by 2030 is still the government's commitment, and that shows Labor is serious about addressing climate change. But of course, the ne necessary transition can't happen overnight. Nevertheless, we have ramped up approval of uh, renewable projects. Which have almost doubled with 104 projects in the pipeline to date. In fact, just this week, the government approved the biggest battery project in Asia and a, a few weeks ago, a massive new solar farm at Smoky Creek in Queensland was given the green light, which will produce enough power for around 200,000 households with a million megawatts more power ent entering the grid. These are just two of 37 renewable energy projects that have been approved since Labor came to office and acted quickly to renew the government the Commonwealth's focus on our renewable energy transition. In relation to the transition, I acknowledge that in the recent past things haven't moved as quickly as some would hope. But the sad fact is that we have had more than a decade of political fighting that had cost us much in our energy transition and action on climate change. Because of the infighting of the coalition and the single-mindedness of the Greens, emissions have been higher for longer and the delivery of certainty for renewable energy projects looking to invest in upscale and clean energy was set back. In their time in government, the coalition had 22 failed uh, energy policies, which got us nowhere. They harboured in their par party, and still do harbour, climate denialists who would happily see all our good work on climate change undermined and reversed. And of course, how could we forget the greatest betrayal of all when it came to the climate uh, future of Australians when the Greens and the Coalition teamed up to sink Labor's carbon pollution reduction scheme uh, when we were last in government? That was a tragic moment for our nation when the old bed fellows of the Coalition and the Greens got together to sink a good policy which by now would have prevented more than 80 million tonnes of emissions being released in the atmosphere. After this decade of lost policy and missed opportunities, Australians rightly ha had a gutful and chose to elect a Labor government in 2022. We acted almost immediately to implement our ambitious climate agenda, including capping emissions, legislation, uh, legislating net zero and reshaping the tone of the debate around climate policy in Australia to acknowledge that the economic challenges of transitioning our country towards renewal re renewable energy was something we could no longer continue to shy away from. And it is in that spirit the government will continue to act, striking the balance and building the framework to locate a clean um, energy future where fossil fuel developments are held up to the light and measured against our legislate, legislated targets and remu renewable energy commitments. The agenda of renewable energy development and ending the climate wars will right be at the forefront of the uh, government's agenda now and in the future. Thank you, Senator. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. 
Three years ago, Professor Graham Samuel was commissioned by the previous government to do a report on our national environmental laws. It was scathing, they are not working and need to be updated. And he found, when it comes to climate, that the impact of climate change on the environment will, will exacerbate pressures and contribute to further decline. In its current state, the environment is not sufficiently resilient to withstand these threats. The current environmental trajectory is unsustainable. What we're seeing in Australia is state capture by the fossil fuel companies and a negligent failure to act by both sides of politics. We know enough. We know too much now to continue down this path and that we, we have uh, Labor ministers, Labor senators, just try and tell us about the, the projects that they are uh, approving when it comes to renewables. And at the same time, they're ramping up our fossil fuel experts, uh, exports. We know how urgent this is. It is now negligence. We are throwing our future under the bus for short-term profits. During my last year in high school, 2005, now Prime Minister Anthony Albanese introduced his own private member's bill to insert a climate trigger into our environmental laws. 2005. Here we are in 2023 and we've got a Labor government that has the numbers to do that today. They won't do it. You have to ask yourself why. Why are we seeing this inaction from Labor? We are disrespecting our climate scientists. We have scientists like jo Dr. Joel Gerges who have put their, their life into raising the alarm, in telling us how bad it is. She was the lead scientist on the, on the last sixth IPCC uh, report, the last one, the last warning before the window of 1.5 to 2 degrees closes, and yet we're seeing an action from Labor. We must do Thank better. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Senator Walters. Uh, thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, people might not realise, but there is no requirement to even think about the impacts on the climate when the Environment Minister has to decide whether to approve or refuse new coal, oil or gas projects. Sounds insane, doesn't it? But that's what our environmental laws, written in 1999, when then Prime Minister John Howard was in charge, that's what those laws say. So 23 years ago, it was decided, and it hasn't been changed since, that the Environment Minister doesn't have to think about the climate when she's ticking off on anything, including coal and gas mines. It is just utterly ridiculous. And I say this as a former environmental lawyer before coming to this place, and I've been involved in several court cases that have tried to fix this, and I want to pay tribute to all of the other community members and environment groups who've continued to try to challenge this patently ridiculous notion through the courts and, sadly, have been largely unsuccessful. Just last week we saw the Environment Minister stand not with the community or the environment, but stand with the coal mining companies and argue against the fact that she should think about the climate when she ticks off on get more coal mines. So we've seen five coal mines approved so far under this new Labor government, who promised to be different to the last government, five new coal mines approved, many of which are in my home state of Queensland, which will turbocharge those bushfires that have already started. I'm getting the SES warnings every day, and it strikes fear into my heart, as I'm sure it does strike fear into anybody's heart who's gone through either the bushfires or the floods, any of these turbocharged natural disasters that we've seen in the last few years. We've got the IPCC, we've got the International Energy Agency. Everybody is saying, our Pacific neighbours, they're saying no new coal, oil and gas. We can't keep warming to one and a half degrees and we are threatening the livelihood and the very existence of not just human settlements but our precious biodiversity. Uh, nature's meant to have an ally in the environment minister, and I'm sorry, but we do not have that in our current environment minister. And when she stands with coal mining companies rather than with nature, uh, it's just heartbreaking. So do better. Um, we need a climate trigger in our environmental laws. We needed one 23 years ago. We definitely need one now. Usually it's something that says you've got to consider an impact on something that's internationally or nationally significant. We think the climate trigger should say you just can't approve new coal, oil and gas. But you know we're open to the conversation at the moment. The environment minister is legally allowed to ignore the impacts on the climate. 
Uh, what they're not ignoring is the political donations made by the fossil fuel companies that flood into the coffers of both of the large parties in this place. We need to stop approving new coal and gas mines, and we need these two parties to stop taking the money from the coal, oil and gas companies. Thank you, Senator Roberts. You have to Thank you. One Nation joins Senator McKim in mourning the current environmental damage as a casualty of destructive net zero climate policy. We do, though, disagree on who is responsible. As we speak today, heavy mach machinery using diesel engines are still crushing the rock that was bulldozed and blasted off the top of mountains in the Atherton Tablelands to make way for wind turbines. A year after Caban, wind turbines turned pristine Australian bushland into an industrial landscape. The crushes are still going. There was that much destruction. That act of environmental vandalism disturbed arsenic in the rock, released into the environment with an unknown cost to our fauna and flora and to humans. Koala habitat has been taken, and while the Greens talk frequently about saving the koalas, they pick and choose which koalas they care about. The Morrison government refused the Lotus Creek wind installation because of the amount of koala habitat the industrial landscape would remove. The Albanese Labor government reversed the decision and approved the creation of another industrial landscape holding 55 turbines. Native habitat protecting biodiversity included the mast owl, magnificent brood frog, Cyrus crane, red goshawk, northern greater glider and the spectacle flying fox. And the devastation is just starting. Mount Fox will have 193 of these machines, these destructive wind turbines. Chalumban, 94. Windy Hill, 20. High Road, 20. Mount Emerald, 37. In just 300 kilometres of pristine North Queensland mountain range, at the end of mining, a mine can be filled in and remediated. Chopping the top of beautiful mountains and cutting 70 metre wide roads into a mountainside to bring in the wind turbines on extended trucks, diesel powered trucks, is permanent environmental vandalism. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Rice. Thank you, Deputy President. There is so much to be despairing about in the world at the moment. We've got thousands dead in Israel and Palestine. We've got a humanitarian catastrophe in Palestine. War crimes being committed, complete disregard for international law. We've got the rise of racism across the world, the defeat, very sadly over the weekend, of a very moderate proposal for a First Nations voice to parliament. We've got authoritarian, oppressive regimes rising around the world. And we have the climate crisis. And it's not hyperbole to say that the climate crisis is an existential threat to our well-being, to the lives of billions and billions of humans on this planet, to our food supplies. In so many of these huge things to be despairing about, these existential threats to the well-being of billions of people on the planet, Australia only plays a pretty small role. And there's not much we can do other than to advocate and to use our influence on the global stage. But on the climate crisis, we are powerful. We can act and act we must. And if you're in any doubt about what we are facing, I do recommend reading the book that I'm currently reading, Humanity's Moment, by IPCC lead author Joel Gerges. It leaves you in no doubt at all just how freaking serious what we are facing is. And I remind people, as I have in so many speeches in this place, that under four degrees of global heating, and that's what the world is currently on track for, that the climate of our wheat growing areas here in Australia becomes like the climate of the central deserts. We will not be able to grow our food. And I remind people that under four degrees of global heating, billions of people who currently live in the tropics will not be able to live in the tropics. They will die. The land that they are living on will be underwater. They will not be able to grow food. They will not be able to survive the extreme heat. Their water supplies will be completely cactus. And the lives of so many other species that we share this planet with, what we are doing to them. I mean, from the penguins currently affected by the melting sea ice and the unprecedented, unprecedented warm ocean temperatures, 
to all of the sea creatures that depend upon the Great Barrier Reef, which this summer and next summer no one looking clear-eyed is going to say that the Great Barrier Reef is going to be in very good shape after the next two summers. And to the animals and the forest that live in our incredible tall, wet forests across the country that are going to be under such threat of massive bushfires like we have never seen before over the next two summers and then getting worse as the temperatures, as the climate gets hotter and hotter. I mean, balance just does not cut it. Balance means catastrophe. We have to act. We can and we must act. Australia is the largest exporter of gas in the world. We are the second largest exporter of coal. We have the power to stop approving and stop op opening up new coal and gas mines. We have the power to stop exporting what is causing the climate crisis. We have to do that if we are going to be playing our role in tackling the climate crisis. We have the power to listen to the climate scientists, to treat the climate crisis as an emergency. We've got the power to shift our energy supplies here to 100 per cent renewable energy and to slash our overall carbon emissions. And we have the power to change our environment laws so that the minister has to take account of the climate crisis in considering whether to approve projects for goodness sake, it's the minimum we can do to insert a climate trigger into our environment laws. Absolutely the very, very minimum that we must do as Australians. But you hear both sides here saying it's too much. Well, what I tell people is if they're not going to listen, well, there's only one thing we can do and we've got to chuck them out because we know what is at stake. And if people are concerned about climate, well, then don't vote for them. Chuck them out. Let the consequences be felt at elections to come, because we know there are things that we can do. The Greens are committed to taking the action, to be building a safe climate, to be restoring a safe climate for all of humanity. And I encourage people to be working with us so that we can do our best to make it happen. Thank you, Senator Rice. Uh, Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. It's unconscionable for an environment minister to continue to approve new coal and gas projects. Each approval makes the climate and biodiversity crisis worse, and it means the destruction of our environment. I recently accepted an invitation to travel to Puruma Island to meet with members of the Torres Strait 8 and young community leaders from Zenith Kess, who are living the consequences of these decisions. It was a real honour and a privilege to be able to spend the day with such an outstanding group of young people who, together with their elders, are working together to protect their island home. After joining the group for a morning of workshops and important conversations, we began the afternoon sessions with a tour of the island, led by Councillor Pearson, to see firsthand how the ever-increasing erosion caused by sea level rise is bringing the ocean right up to their front doors. Councillor Pearson explained how the amount of land lost to erosion is increasing each year and showed us the walls of sandbags that are the only thing standing between people's homes, which are now perilously close to the water's edge and the rising seas. I also listened to distressing first-hand accounts of islanders having to collect their ancestors' bones from the beach as their burial grounds are repeatedly inundated by seawater. And I listened to their pleas for no new coal and gas and government investment in seawalls. If the Labor government is serious about tackling the climate and biodiversity crisis, instead of fighting tooth and nail to approve new coal and gas projects, they must consider the damage that will inevitably flow from each approval of a new coal or gas mine. And they must fix our environment laws so the minister cannot ignore the impacts of climate pollution. Thank you, Senator Orman Payne. Senator Shoebridge. Acting Deputy President, you couldn't make this stuff up. We have an environment, environment minister, Minister Plebisek, approving coal mine after coal mine after coal mine and never having to check on the climate change implications of that. How could you possibly come up with laws that look at environmental assessment and when it comes to coal mines, not assess the climate impact of approving a coal mine. I'll tell you how you do that. 
You do that because the Labor Party and the Coalition join together to gut our environment laws and ignore the impact of climate. Just since coming into office, Minister Plibersek has already approved four new or expanded coal mines. We're talking about 55 million tonnes of additional coal. That's about 150 million tonnes of CO2, all on Minister Plibersek's watch, actually approved by her. And not once, not once did the minister have to consider climate impacts when doing that. That is absurd. And it's actually dangerous to our national security. It's dangerous to our regional security, as we've heard um, from speaker after speaker. But what's worse is there's another 29 of these projects lined up waiting for Minister Plibersek to sign off. Another 29 new or expanded coal mines. And under the current laws, never have to consider the climate impacts. We're talking about more than 5,000 million tonnes of coal. 5,000 million tonnes of coal. About 12 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide. Could you imagine, could you imagine having environment laws that see Minister Plibersek signing off on 29 new coal mines, billions of tonnes of carbon emissions and never considering, considering climate? The only way that happens is because Labor and the Coalition are in the pocket of the fossil fuel industries and they want to burn our planet down. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. No. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McKim teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan teller for the noes. Senator McKim, you are telling for the eyes. Order. The result of the division is ayes 11, noes 25. The question is resolved in the negative. I will give those senators who may not be participating in the next uh, item of business to vacate if they so wish. The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator O'Sullivan, which is also shown at item 16 on today's order of business. Is consideration of the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips, and I call Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. The matter of public importance that uh, I've moved here today is for the Senate to take a look and recognise the fact that the Prime Minister Albanese needs to prioritise helping Australian households and small businesses deal with the cost of living crisis. Now, anyone that's spending any time in the community speaking to any Australian recognises that this is the single biggest issue that Australians are facing right now. And it's not just those that are on low incomes. It's affecting people right the way through to even the upper bands of the, the middle income and, and even some of the higher incomes. It's, it's a cost of living crisis that is impacting upon every Australian. Yet this Prime Minister has proven that he is distracted and he is not capable of dealing with multiple things at once like a Prime Minister should be able to do. A government should be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. But this government is proving that they are not even capable of doing that. They have just held this referendum uh, 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 and a resounding uh, decision was made, a resounding uh, uh, position was given by the Australian people to this government to get back focus on the things that really are going to impact on their lives. But it's actually worse than the fact that they can't do multiple things at once. The issue is they don't actually have a reasonable, sensible, workable plan to address this cost of living crisis. So it's not just that they're not capable of doing a few things at once. They don't actually even have a plan that's reasonable, that's sensible, that's actually workable, that's going to deliver 
on uh, addressing this rampant inflation that we've got. Now, Australians are knowing. No, they know that petrol prices are going up, rental prices are going up, your mortgage has gone up. Australians have been forced to spend significantly more uh, for the critical items that they need, like their groceries. I said fuel and insurance. Insurance has gone through the roof. Energy has gone through the roof. Housing. And, and, and they're spending these things rather than the things that they really want. It's a in its decision to keep October uh, interest rates unchanged at 4.1 per cent, I want to read from a, a statement from the RBA. They said that the economy is still experiencing a period of below-trend growth, and this is expected to continue for a while. High inflation is weighing on people's real incomes and household consumption growth is weak, as is dwelling investment. High inflation makes life difficult for everyone and damages the functioning of the economy, they said. Now listen to this. They said it erodes the value of savings, hurts household budgets and makes it harder for businesses to plan and invest, and it worsens income inequality. Now, this is why inflation should have been and needs to be the absolute number one priority of this government, but they're lost at sea, and it is impacting upon Australians. Australians are hurting right now, but this government is distracted by all sorts of other things, like, for example, industrial relations reform that really is just aimed at increasing the union grip and control upon our workplaces of Australia. That's what this government has planned for the industrial relations system, because it's not truly addressing the issues. They could be quite precisely dealing with some of the matters that, that relate to the industrial relations system, but instead they've got this broad brush response that is going to cruel business that's going to actually drive down employment in this country. If you're a casual, forget about it under this government. If you're wanting flexibility in the workplace, forget about it in this government. If you have to work a second job to actually make ends meet, forget about it under this government. They're completely lost at sea. Completely lost at sea. They've been distracted, but their plans are not actually addressing the issues. We've seen productivity, productivity at a seven-year low, and there's nothing that this government is doing to address productivity. Real, real wages are going backwards because all wages are doing is just chasing the high inflation that you are creating by your, by your economic measures that are not actually helping people to address their cost of living. This government is lost at sea. They're distracted and they need to get focused because it's hurting people. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Sheldon. Thank you. Um, well, isn't it interesting? I, mean, I don't think there's a person, certainly on this side, that doesn't have a concern about how tight it is out there in budgets, household budgets at the moment. And the reason I say on this side, because we actually understand there's a cost of living pressures, that inflation is being felt around kitchen tables around the country. But obviously those on the other side don't know that because instead of supporting relief, the coalition keeps putting up roadblocks. Instead of answers they, they instead of having answers, they're aimless. The only answer is they ha say no. They say no to the lowering of prices, power prices. We introduce coal and gas price caps, easing the pressure on energy bills. Then those opposite turn around and say no. They said no to energy bill relief. In partnership with states, we are delivering rebates for around 5 million households and 1 million small businesses. Now, they said no to better pay and more secure jobs for Australian workers. And of course, those on the opposite side want to say this is some sort of you know, class war. But what's actually the battle, what's actually the argument, is between good employers who do the right thing and bad employers who are happy to rip people off either by not giving them an ethical fair return on their labour, whether they be a small business person, an owner-driver, a gig worker, or whether they be an employee, whilst good companies doing the right thing are being unfairly competed with by the companies that are always on the opposite side, always on the side of making sure we can make it as tough as we can rather than lifting all boats. And of course, when you start talking about those that are on the side 
of the good side of business, you have to talk about people like Peter Anderson from the Australian Road Transport Industry Organisation, the National Secretary. And he says about the laws that's proposed, representing small, medium and large businesses across this country in transport, he says, our unity shows how critical it is for federal parliament to pass reform into law to give all industry participants a fighting chance when talking about the laws that have been proposed. Of course, they'll hate this, but Michael Caine from the Transport Workers Union, the head of the largest small business organisation in this country, says life-saving transport reform in the ants is the answer, and the federal parliament is being asked by the entire industry to pass it into law. Because as a small business representative and an employee representative, and as other business representatives are saying, we need to have laws to change and make our businesses safer, more secure and more viable. But that doesn't fit with the politics on the other side, because they want fights between capital and labour. They want to have make sure that they pretend they're on, they're on the capital side, when in actual fact the reality is lots of good operating businesses want reforms. They want fair reforms. Now, Warren Clark, the National Road Transport Association, who had some different views only some years back, but now is one of the leading lights in saying there needs to be reform and there needs to be so that we can bolster and build productivity and enhance safety for everyone. And of course, the National Road Fr uh, Freighters Association, very similar position for its owner drivers in long distance, some of the toughest places to be working in across the country. And of course, when you start looking about those people that are so worried, so worried, and it just gripes me. You think that they say they're so worried about the pressure on households. They said no to 30,000 new social and affordable homes, including for victims of domestic violence. They've said no more broadly to better pay and more secure jobs for Australian workers. They've even got the, the Minerals Council of Australia getting up at a, an inquiry just uh, into the changing, uh, closing the loopholes legislation where Tanya Constable got up and said they were actually paying labour hire workers more money than they are paying direct hire workers. In actual fact, she said on average $300 extra a week. Oh, but wait a minute, it was only some weeks ago they were saying it was going to cost the mining industry billions of dollars. On one hand, it is $300 better off for those workers that uh, she is putting to everybody, and on the other hand, it is costing billions of dollars. It does not compute, because the fact is what they don't like on the other side, and some of the big business they back in this country, not the good big business, not good business, but bad business in the mining industry, what they are frightened to do is to turn around and call them out for the prejudice that they brought to the table in this debate. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. First and foremost, I want to point out the sheer hypocrisy. The opposition suddenly care about the cost of living now when they're in opposition. But in the nine years they were in power, what did we actually see to help everyday Australians? Absolutely nothing. We saw rorts of multiple forms, tax cuts for the rich and legs ups for the uh, multi-million dollar companies that they support. And I'm glad that the opposition finally caught up uh, to the, uh, to the, that the major parties might actually have to start caring about people. But unfortunately for them, it is too late. And I hope that they remember when they come into government again and don't have selective amnesia, that it is the everyday Australian that is currently struggling. And that the fact that they bought on this MPI, I really, really hope that this is a sustainable memory for them. Now, I've done a lot of travelling in the past month, especially in Western Australia, and one thing that not just shocked me but also appalled me is that um, how prices were absolutely so high, particularly more remote that I went. So I'll give you an example. In Roeburn, for a litre of milk today, it costs seven dollars. Seven dollars for people. Now we wonder why we see an increase in preventable deaths in uh, some of those communities where prices are forcing people to consume not just what they can find, but also what they can afford. Um, which is often doesn't add up to your basic healthy diet with fruit and vegetables. There's a lot of processed food, full of sugar, full of, full of salt, and God knows what else um, out in those communities. So um, this is something that the, the people are being forced into because of the cost of living pressures. Now, this is not the individual's fault. 
Um, people are just simply doing the best they can to get by. And when I talk to people on the ground, they are saying, where do we turn for these solutions? Because no one is offering any of those up. Now, the issue is also with the corporations that are profiting off the cost of living crisis. The issue is the, the major parties uniting to keep people on income support um, and in poverty. And the issue is with the lack of investment in our rural communities right across this country. Now, of course, something needs to be done to help people in this cost of living crisis, but I am telling those folks out there watching, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled that this MPI today, brought on by the coalition, will be the ones that deliver the long-term solutions that are actually required to solve this. They will not be the ones offering up the solutions because they didn't do it while they're in government and they're certainly not going to do it now. Thank you, Senator Cox. Senator Roberts. Thank you. The failed Albanese voice referendum is the latest spit in the face Australians have had to cop from the government. At a time when bills are going up and bank accounts are going backwards, Australians are going to be furious when they hear how much Anthony Albanese's Labor government just wasted on a referendum. All I can say is brace yourself for the answer. $450 million. That's how much the Australian Electoral Commission is estimating last week's referendum cost. If you woke up with a hangover after some celebrations on the weekend and were scared to check your bank account, spare a moment to think about the Australian Electoral Commission. If their estimates are correct, the AEC have blown their budget for the referendum by nearly $100 million. In the middle of a cost of living crisis, Anthony Albanese has blown $450 million, almost half a billion dollars, on his personal vanity project. What did Australians get for this bill? Australians rightly rejected inserting racial division into the Constitution with a thumping victory for the no case. Not a single state reached a majority yes. Only the small Canberra Territory, the bubble, recorded a yes majority. The yes side spewed divisive, racial, abusive rhetoric while claiming the high moral ground. The country is worse off for being put through this divisiveness at a huge cost and for a proposal that should never have been put forward. Australia rightly asked, why is this voice issue distracting government? As mortgage payments skyrocket, grocery bills shock budgets, and life continues to get tougher, why was dangerous virtue signalling the government's top priority? Why? I'm saddened to be the one to break the answer to you. This government does not care about you. While I thank the Liberals for bringing on this matter of importance and allowing us to discuss it, they weren't any better in government. Honestly. The Liberals put a wrecking ball through the economy and handed it over to the Labor government in one of the greatest hospital passes in political history. Yet, Labor doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell of navigating us out of this one. Neither Liberal nor Labor can fix the cost of living crisis because they're both committed to the UN's net zero pipe dream that caused the cost of living crisis. This government is committed to net zero by 2050. They may, may as well be committed to driving us all off a cliff. If we keep going down this path, then the number of Australians who can pay their power bills will be next to zero. Australia doesn't have to do this by ourselves and find out the hard way. We can learn from many other countries further down this pipe dream path than we are. Every other country that's tried to force their power grid onto wind and solar has had their power prices go up by a proportionate amount. When plotted on a graph, it's nearly a straight line heading upwards, and it's all for nothing. The hard data shows that Australians' carbon dioxide production cannot affect the climate above natural variability. The lie that wind and solar are cheaper is easily debunked by fact, this fact. With more wind, solar, batteries and hydro on the grid than ever in our history, power bills have never been higher. It's all a crock designed to fill the pockets of parasitic billionaire wind and solar proponents, fraudulently taking subsidies and donating to camp people in this, in this office that support wind and in this Senate that support wind and solar. Australians already pay billions in subsidies to these billionaire predators and pay again as their power bills skyrocket. Yet Labor, Liberal and even the fake farmer friends and nationals are all committed to the UN's net zero by 2050. After all the talk about truth telling, here's some cold hard truth. The cost of living crisis cannot end until we ditch United Nations net zero plans. One Nation is the only party that accepts those facts and can deliver cheaper power bills for Australia. Turn the coal-fired power generators back on, cut the, all the subsidies for the parasitic wind and solar industry, and just get back to common sense, hard data and truth. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Rennick. 
to Acting Madam Deputy President, and I rise today to speak to the fact that the Albanese Labor government has no solutions for the cost of living crisis. And for the first 16 months of their term in government, they have wasted on an idea that cost $400 million and it all went up in smoke. It was something that the Australian people never asked for, never wanted, and on the weekend they voted a resounding no to the voice. But yet Anthony Albanese, in his little narrow-minded view of the world, thought that we needed to divide this country by race. What a disgrace. What a disgrace. And what makes it even worse is the fact that we have been going through a cost of living crisis brought about by you know, a COVID overreach. Uh, we've got uh, energy crisis and all of these bad government policies driving up uh, the cost of living. And Anthony Albanese, or the Prime Minister's response, has been to focus on feelings rather than facts. And the facts of the matter are this, is that the Australian people are doing it tough. They are doing it tough, Adam Acting Deputy President, and it's about time we saw the Albanese Labor government provide some solutions. Provide some solutions for the rental crisis. But what's their solution? Higher immigration. Higher immigration, all designed to aid and abet the inner city Marxists who teach at our universities so that our students can come out and graduate brainwashed and bankrupt. That's the only people that are benefiting from immigration. Of course, it might help Labor get a few more votes because God knows anyone who's lived in this country long enough knows you would never vote Labor if you want to hold on to your hard-earned wages. Because if they're not stealing it through your taxes, they're stealing it through superannuation. And if they're not stealing it through superannuation, they're stealing it through higher energy prices, acting Madam Deputy Speaker. And I say that it is about time the Labor government actually started to focus on the things that matter to the Australian people. The things that matter to the Australian people. And that is they want to keep their hard-earned wages in their pocket. So not only do we have a rental crisis or a housing crisis brought about by high immigration and an RBA, an out-of-control RBA, that only, whose only solution to anything is to increase the cost of uh, interest. There's no talk about quantitative uh, uh, issuing new shares and building new infrastructure to increase the supply of energy, decrease, increase the supply of water, increase the supply of uh, transport and better roads. No, 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 no. All they can do is impose austerity upon the Australian people. And then we've got an energy crisis as well. Power prices are through the roof. Now, the Labor government love to blame with what's going on in Ukraine. But here's the thing. Australia has abundant reserves of coal. It has abundant reserves of gas. It has abundant reserves of nuclear. Why don't we use our own home growing resources to actually supply the raw materials needed to actually produce energy? No, no, no. What the Labor government would rather do is import renewables built overseas, built overseas and then shut down our own local industries. That is a disgrace. That is an absolute disgrace. And then we have the cost of living crisis compounded by the rental crisis and the energy crisis. But of course, then we have Labor's obsession with red tape, uh, green tape, blue tape, and all these fees and costs that everyone uh, has to comply with in order to get any business done in this country. And we've seen that with IR laws that are actually going to make it harder to do business. And we see that in so many other aspects in the economy, where Labor wants to impose command and control over every aspect of an individual or a business's uh, decision-making process. Rather than supply more services uh, into the economy, such as more power stations, whether it be coal, gas or nuclear, whether they want to build more dams, so we can have more water on our uh, beautiful black soil across all parts of Australia to supply more food, or to actually, heaven forbid, actually have cheaper energy to restart our manufacturing process. Do Labor want to do anything about that? No. What they want to do is increase the superannuation rate so that workers pay more money to the rent-seeking white-collar parasites in the ivory palaces in Sydney and Melbourne uh, and other means of uh, 
doing business as well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Pocock. Deputy President, um, cost of living is a huge issue in communities across the country. I recently did a survey of almost 2,000 Canberrans and cost of living came out as number one. It is affecting um, households and small businesses. We heard this morning from small businesses that they are facing a double whammy because they are facing increased costs in their small business at the same time that their mortgage is going up and we know how leveraged many small businesses are. There are a number of things that can be done by the parliament to deal with this. There, there are solutions. Firstly, we can look at competition. The recent inquiry into Qantas has laid bare the need for better competition laws in this country, where you've got in the airline industry between Qantas and Virgin 95 per cent market share, with Qantas working, walking away with 80 per cent of the profits. Something is wrong. We need to step in and ensure there is more competition. It's not just airlines. That should be the starting point. We've got two grocery chains with 70 per cent market share, three dominant energy retailers, four major banks with 75 per cent of mortgages. The list goes on. It's a failure of policy to ensure that people are getting a better deal. Housing clearly underpins the cost of living crisis, and we've seen both major parties not want to talk about what can be done when it comes to housing policy that is set up for housing to not be a human right that people in our community should be able to afford, but to be an investment vehicle. Those have been the rules. People have, have used that, but we have to turn this, this, this ship around. We have to ensure that people in our communities can afford to have a safe place to call home. Another solution is electrification. We know that households and small businesses can save thousands of dollars a year when they electrify. With the cost of uh, fuel going to foreign uh, oil companies, that money can be saved and spent in our, in our local communities. There are solutions ready to go. What we need is, is for policymakers to step up and put policies in place that ensure that households and small businesses uh, can benefit from electrification and that nobody is left behind. We saw in the, in the, in the US the Inflation Reduction Act, an ambitious, uh, wide-ranging policy with a big part of it focused on electrification and ensuring that the, the gap between uh, electric and fossil fuel is bridged so that people can unlock the savings now. Um, rather than in the future. And I would urge the government to come up with a bold, comprehensive response to the Inflation Reduction Act. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, clearly, with, to the Australian people, Labor's gig is up. We said before the last election they had no economic plan, and sadly for our nation, they have every single day demonstrated they still have no economic plan for our nation. Over halfway through their term, uh, what are they doing? The only things that they've implemented are policies that were handed to them by the trade union movement and also by the left of the Labor Party. And we've seen that tragically play out in the divisive referendum that this nation has just gone through, and also in the frightening industrial relations legislation they failed to tell the Australian people about before the last election. But you have a look at any other policy, and not just the absence of an economic policy, but every other policy they wasted nine years in, in opposition, not developing a single policy in defence reviews for nearly two years and no action, in emergency management, a royal commission, implementable uh, things straight away, they're still doing two reviews. The NDIS, probably the most criminal uh, lack of action on the NDIS in its history. And nearly two years later, they will still be reviewing uh, while the scheme is in trouble. But most importantly for all Australians, and particularly West Australians, this government has no economic plan. Now, it is true, and this government sadly is still demonstrating, that under every Labor government that over the last 30 years, on average, Labor have delivered higher unemployment, higher interest rates, higher electricity prices and higher taxes. And now, higher inflation and uh, cost of living for just about everything for Australian families. 
and instead they're sitting there dealing with everything else but the actions that will drive down the cost of living for Australians. And in fact, they are pump priming the economy to make inflation even higher and the cost of living even higher on Australians. Taming inflation should be the government's first, second and third priority, but it is not. Families right across Australia, and including in Senator O'Sullivan and my home state of Western Australia, families are doing it incredibly tough. Uh, both Senator O'Sullivan and I have visited Food Bank many times, and it is absolutely heartbreaking to see what is happening. Uh, every, for every single interest rate, what, 10 or 11 is it, under Labor? Food banks see uh, a significant number of increase in um, access to their uh, food supplies. And most, in, most importantly and most sadly, they are seeing over 70 per cent of the people they are now assisting are people who have never had to seek support before. They are two-income families who are absolutely struggling uh, under the cost of living pressures that this government continues to inflict. Over 1, 000, sorry, 116,000 children in Western Australia now live in severely food insecurity households this year alone. 208,000 households in Western Australia went hungry. Can you believe this? In Australia, in Western Australia, two over 200,000 households went hungry in the last 12 months due to a lack of money and having to skip meals, sometimes going for days without eating. And 23 per cent, 23 per cent of households in Western Australia with mortgages experienced food insecurity in the last year. And this is completely and utterly outrageous. But it's not only the cost of living and finding it very difficult to feed their families. Uh, the cost of petrol under this government has skyrocketed to somewhere in, in WA over to, you know, uh, $2 a litre an increase of over 10 per cent. Many families, and particularly the elderly, are no longer able to use their cars because they cannot afford the cost of petrol. Housing is such an important issue, and it is such a challenging issue for, so many, for far too many West Australians. Home rental prices in Perth have increased by nearly 20 per cent in the last 12 months alone. That is a complete and utter disgrace. And despite all of the rhetoric from those opposite about homelessness, the number of people sleeping rough in Western Australia has increased by over 100 per cent since Labor came to government. Perth has the tightest vacancy rate, and so it goes on and on. West Australians Order, simply Senator cannot Reynolds, afford this Labor government, and shame expired, on you for doing it. And the time for this discussion has expired.